no way. We can't go to the bank for a loan for seeds because if we don't have a harvest in September, we just put this farm up for collateral. So if we can't pay them back the hundred dollars worth of seeds, oh, let's 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 make it ten thousand, a hundred thousand. There you go for more of these people's generation kind of stuff. With hundred thousand dollars worth of seeds, we're well, gonna lose the farm. And Dad said, "Oh, please, hundred thousand dollars in seeds, man. When those seeds come in, we make a million dollars easy on the crops." And Mom said, "But what have we have a pestilence, flood, famine, you know, locusts? How we determine what God has in store for us?" We're gambling everything we got, and we're going to lose the farm. We're going to lose everything if we can't pay him the hundred thousand. And the dad's like, "Oh, come on now, it's easy. We only got to go through what seven months. We got this covered." You hear people taking out mortgages for twenty, thirty years, and I just laugh. I said, "Wait a second. What you had a one-year mortgage, a six-month mortgage? No, a twenty-year mortgage. Thirty. Oh, so you thought for the next twenty years you're not going to get sick?" You're not going to get injured. You're not going to lose your job. You're not going to have a medical expense. You know, somebody in your family's not going to die. For some reason, you thought everything was just be hunky dory for 30 years. For some reason, you just thought life was going to be peachy keen for the next 360 months, and you're going to be able to pay all your bills. Really? When back then, if somebody went from loan for six, seven months, they were like, "That's outrageous." People thought very hard and very long before they went to borrow money from somebody else because somebody wanted collateral and if it didn't come through people gave up the farm immediately they didn't say well I'm going to stick around for two three years in court and let me see if I could get away with not giving them the money back what we owe them because what happened over the years when communities pooled their money together, it was one-to-one. -one. When you went to the bank, if you gave them a dollar, you expected a dollar back immediately, and that money had to be on hand, or it had to be written out in paper somewhere. There had to be a note out there, outstanding, a note for every dollar that they took in. When fractional reserve came in, into play, then if that every one dollar came in, they could have unlimited amount. It started, first it was one to two, and then obviously one to three, and then, or one to three point four, then one to three point seven, then one to three point nine. Now it's one to to trillions. It doesn't matter how many dollars come in. It's, it's it's all magical numbers, and this is why you people are saying that about mortgages now. It's like, well, wait a second. Since this isn't real anymore, why should I care anymore what the banks do? Because they already wrote it off. They already got paid for it. You know, they sold the note. They broke the note down into trillions of pieces. No man is actually being harmed or injured if I don't pay it back because that one dollar just been fractionalized into trillions now. So like I said, that's that's the difference between a mortgage and a loan like that back in the good old times and the good old days, and that's why I just laugh when people wanted Ron Paul, which a lot of most everybody listens to me, wanted Ron Paul to win. He wanted us to go back to the gold standard, right? Ron Paul said, let's go back to the gold standard, remember? Yep. Yeah, what's the problem with that? Very and you in China, it's like 90% of the gold. USA is way down here somewhere. So, if we went back to the gold standard, these guys would come and buy us. I don't want to go on the gold standard. Let's do something we got. How about pine trees or pine cones? I don't want to deal with gold. Are you kidding me? The Chinese and Indians will bear upon us in 20 minutes. They'll say, all right, we're down the gold standard. Let's whip out all our gold and all their families will whip out all their gold. And let's see how much gold your family's got compared to an Indian family. So I'm seeing how much gold these people. Watch, look at their wedding ceremonies. Google that. The, the, the whole thing is gold. Everything is gold. Glad to go car. Right. Look at their wedding gown. Their wedding. Everything is gold. I mean, nobody's family in this. Country. Maybe there are some families in this country that have that much gold, but. No, that's like what everybody strives for over there in India and China's gold. Carl, can I ask you that question about that case where you... Yeah, sure. There's two things. The judge, you said you taught him, but then he was he changed you to the plaintiff. And I remember you talking about it on your radio, or your talk to you. Do the judges know what you do? And when you say I require paper, pen, and ink to properly answer the court, I know you know it's not a court. Yeah, they're not a, a judge. When, so when how say, do you? Say I, was I, he testing you? 
you to say I require leave of court. But is it? A, it's not a court, though. For paper, pen, and ink. So you can't just say I need paper and pen because the guy gets all your pen and it's got no ink in it. So I don't be cute with the judge. I specifically say paper, pen, and ink. I want a freaking pen. What do you do? Your pen is empty. Well, you didn't ask for the ink. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I require leave a call for paper, for paper, pen, and ink. So I could properly answer the call. The man called me up yesterday. And see, this is how a judge will get you really quick and easy off your game. He did it as poor man. And I laughed because I'm ready for the game. to settle our problems is we used to cross swords. That's how we did it. Remember what happened to Alexander Hamilton and what happened to Burke? Yep. Remember the poor Vice President, poor Secretary of the Treasury? What happened? Somebody called somebody's wife fat, the other guy died. Now we cross words. Now Hamilton and Burke would have went and made a civil suit against each other, libel or slander. Now that's when the civil procedure of going to court really started to kick in the gear when this guy died. We can't have the people, the vice president, killing the secretary of the treasury just because he said your wife's hat makes her look fat. You know, whatever he insulted him, he insulted him. That led to a duel. That then he crossed swords. Now we cross words, and nerds are great at crossing words, and that's what these judges are. And what you were saying, you know, it's like I require leave a call for paper and an ink, because like I say to people, when people say to you, um. Uh, two and two is four, everybody knows what I just said. Two and two is four, right? Two, two and two equals four, right? Everybody agrees two and two equals four? Everybody understands that everybody agrees two and two equals four? Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I knew two and two equals four, stuff. you all knew what I was saying? You all knew what I meant? We knew what you meant. Oh, or did, or did you think I meant this? <laughs> Oh, so I guess it wasn't a meeting of the minds. I knew you meant whatever you're going to end up meaning. Yeah. <laughs> but I had no clue how I was going to get there. No. Right. That's what they're doing to you guys. They're crossing words. A judge will stand there and say, well, you do know two and two is four, right? We all agree that two and two equals four, right? Do you have a problem with that? No, no, two and two equals four. Oh, good. Oh, I got you. I'd like to but argue you, that. Yeah. But right, you always right. say don't give them life by talking well, to what them. What I'm saying is, sir, it's whatever you believe. You know, I do not what you believe. You believe whatever you wish to believe. You know, so like I said, when the judge said to the man yesterday, he said to him, I require leave a call for paper, pen, and ink. And the judge says, it is not necessary. The guy didn't know how to come back. See, what you guys are doing, you're one-trick ponies. You guys are learning a couple of key phrases from me, and then the judge throws another one out of the It's like, oh, I don't remember call saying that. What if the judge said, if the judge says no, we say this. If the judge says, okay, we do that, but the judge says, it's not necessary. Huh. That's not yes and it's not no. Call never went over. And one, one of the judges says, That's, that won't be necessary. I said to him, do you know what necessary is? And nobody knows what the word necessary means. It's what is, this, what is, what is essential for life. What is necessary? What's essential for life? This is what needs for me to live, for me to carry on, for me to continue. It is necessary. Without that, I can't continue, I can't live, I can't go on. So what's funny is, I believe it's Article 1, Section 18. It's a necessary and proper clause in the Constitution. It's the very last section of Article 1. It's very yeah, last. but you weren't asking him if, it was, if he thought it was necessary or not, right? The reason why you go with the word necessary, the judge will say it's not necessary, is because when the initial folks got together back in the colonies, got together and they were going to enact the Constitution, 100 guys showed up, 50 guys signed, half of them left, including give me liberty and give me death, Mr. Patrick Henry left when he saw Clause 18, because it's a necessary and proper clause. 
and says that any officer or any agent of the government could do whatever is necessary and proper to enforce this Constitution. So they said, what? Necessary? That means you could basically kill anything that gets in your way. Yes, that's exactly what we mean. Oh, really? Because if you read about the trial of the Maginot, trying to say how to spell Maginot. It's something like that. Maginot. Like the Magnificent. The Maginot. It's a cabin boy story with the sale of the, the first mate and the captain eat the, the cabin boy. And they land back in England and obviously the cabin boy's mom and dad says, where's Junior? Well, unfortunately we had to eat him. <laughs> Why is that? We were hungry. That's not a really good reason. Well, it was necessary and proper for us to get this shipment through. We had to do what we had to do. You know, we were, uh, the ship was leaking, we had to go on a sailboat, you know, we had to go to a small ship. We, was, we were dying. It was necessary and proper. So the necessary and proper clause is where you could actually say the reason why you had to cannibalize somebody and eat somebody is because it was necessary. Not only necessary, it's proper. So when a judge said to him, that will not be necessary, the guy didn't say, not only is it necessary, it's proper. I require a leave of court for paper pending, so I probably answer this court. It is necessary, not only is it necessary, I'd say to the judge, but it's also proper. And the judge would say, oh, you know, it's in the same proper clause. And that's right. It's for the essential of life for this to continue on for me to be as I am. It's necessary that I do this. He didn't know how to answer the judge. The judge said, well, that won't be necessary. You may believe it's not necessary. I believe it's necessary and proper. And the judge would say, this guy knows what the hell he's talking about. He knows the necessary and proper clause. People who think they know the Constitution don't know Jack because every single section above 17 due to 18 is negated. Mm. Every single control and limit that the government has over its citizens is gone just because they finished it up at number 18. Everything above here means meaningless. Anytime any agent or any officer, any agent, it would be some little pipsqueak, 18, 19 year old agent who just was a United States government officer. He says, well, I have to do what necessary and proper to prevail, to have this government continue. This is what I believe is necessary and proper for the government to function properly. Oh, really? So you're going to tell me how that takes the United States government to function properly? Isn't that just special? So some little snot-nosed 18-year-old, 19-year-old agent is going to say, well, it was necessary and proper for the, for, for the uh, survival of the United States government to, uh, you know, act as it does. Terrorize, terrorize, terrorist, however you want to, terrorism, however you want to do it. Oh. Does anybody know what terrorize, terrorist, or terrorism means? Terrorize is interfere with proper uh, procedure of government. Yeah, proper function of government. The terrorize is to interfere with the proper function of the government. Okay? That makes sense? To terrorize somebody. You, you can't move because you're terrorized. This guy's scaring the living crap out of you. You're terrorized. You're like, oh, you're ter terrified. So it's the interference with the proper function of a government. Okay? This, don't answer because you listen to my show, but every single person I ever ask always gets this answer wrong. Now, one person has ever got this question right. What form of government do we have upon this land? What form of government? What form of government operates upon this land? So, terrorist. What's that? Terrorist. No, no, no. I mean, do we live in a republic? Do we live in a democracy? Do we live in a monotheism? Do we live in a dictatorship? Oligarchy. Dictatorship, oligarchy. Right. Do we live in a democratic monarchy? Do we live in an anarchy? All right. Everybody gets it wrong. So. Anarchy. What's an anarchy? Anarchy. What's an anarchy? Self-government. That's, that's, there is no leaders. We are all sovereign to our own, yet we have no control over our fellow man. We are all equal in the eyes of the law. No one's above anybody. We we'll all have equal standing in the eyes of the God. That'd be nice if that was true. That's why they make this word sound insane. We self-govern. I 
On October 17, 2013, Barack Obama gave the most inspiring presidential address I've ever heard in my life, or at least the first part of it. He said the greatest gifts our forefathers gave us was the right to self-govern. Self-governance. We had the right to self-govern. That's the greatest gift our forefathers gave us was the right to self-govern. There is no kings. All the powers and all the rights that were within the king are now within the people. The people are now sovereign to their own. Okay? We're all equal. We have no more power over our fellow men than any other man. All the powers that have resided with the king now reside with us. I'm sure that, you know, I'm not sure exactly where the Declaration of Independence is, but it's, that's where we find it. Then, poor Obama. When you hear Simon saying, when you hear the phrase, that being said, do you know what that being said means? It means the complete opposite. Don't worry what I just said. That being said, now I'm going to come at you with something completely different. I'm going to do 180 on you people. We have a government that is called a democracy. Mob rule. And the mob rules. He said, we live in a democracy. So now for these four years that I'm in charge, you'll do as I say. If you don't like the rule of law that I put down in four years, vote me out. And then I will obey you and do what you say. But right now, I'm in charge, and you will do what I tell you to do. That's a democracy, where 51% tells the 49 what to do. So he goes from saying, we self-govern. The greatest gift our forefathers gave us was the right to self-govern. That being said, I'm in charge for the next four years. If you don't like it, vote me out in four years, and you tell me what to do. So I'm like, wow, what a twist. <laughs> that was magnificent. <laughs> And, like, did anybody see that but me? <laughs> First he says we have an anarchy where there's no leaders. And then he says we have a democracy where the mob rules. Where you could have, you know, a million people saying, you know, Carl Lentz should die today. Yay. We had a vote. Yay. But wait a second. If we self-govern and there is no leaders and we have an anarchy, wait a second. We're all liable for our own actions then. Yes. Huh. But that's pretty dangerous because the people nowadays are pretty ungodly. So there's a reason why government had the government grows because the people need to be governed. It's that simple. The more evil the people are, the more you hope for more government control over people. Okay, so when the colonies first started, in the 1640s, thank God King James was around. Huh. Because he changed Catholicism's Lord's Prayer to the King James Version of Prayer, the English version of the King's Lord of the Lord's Prayer. What's the difference between the King James Version and the old 2,000-year-old um, uh, Catholic Version? What's the difference in the Lord's Prayer? Does anybody know off the top of their head? Yeah, I know, real Bible thump right now. Thank God my sister partied a lot and I was so bored because TV went off at 1 a.m. back then and I opened up every freaking book and read every freaking book that my mom had. The difference between the Lord's Prayer, does anybody know the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven. No, I lay me down to sleep. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. How it goes is when Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You want me to say the whole thing? Yeah, you almost done. You almost said forgive us our trespasses. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. The Catholic version is the trespass. You are not a Protestant, I can tell, because you would know, please forgive us of our debt as we wish others to forgive us of our debts. Guilt. Because what were they doing? Back then, they were shipping people from a merry old England all around the world, Australia, the Americas, because they owed five shillings. They'd send your ass off to Canada, the Americas, wherever, because you owe a lousy five pence, five shillings to somebody. 
it leave your wife and kids and everything because you owe the debt. And you couldn't pay it, well, they'd ship you off. You know, it might cost them, you know, 10,000 pounds to, to send you off there, but they didn't care because you owed five cents, you were going to work that off too as well. So you're basically going to be a slave until you paid the 10,000 book passage plus the five shillings. So they said, you know, we're going to forgive each other of our debts because this is getting ridiculous. You know, these bankers and creditors are sending people from their families all over the planet. This is getting sick. So the people had enough. Uh, Charles lost his head in King James, which was a lot bigger man than Charles was. Charles was a little guy. <laughs> James came, everybody who messed with his daddy, well, James butchered them. So they shouldn't have touched his daddy. Payback's a bitch. So anyway, the Lord's prayer should forgive the trespass. And why was this incredibly important? This course, say back then when you had the Jamestown colonies going, Plymouth colony going, you had a butcher, a banker, a candlestick maker. You had a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. That's it. If this guy owed a debt, you send him to debt as prison, who's going to bake the freaking bread? Nobody. But you got this guy shipped off out of, what, you shipped him out of Jamestown, you sent him off to the... the East Indies, the West Indies, to go pay back five shillings. Now, you know what? I think we wouldn't let the big, uh, wouldn't let him slide. Why? Because we need freaking bread, and he's the only guy who knows how to fire up this oven. That's why. What's yeast? I don't freaking know. This guy does. Let's get him back. That's why they forgive the, the trespasses. That's why we live in the Americas, thank God. Because the American rule is this rule. We have a Judeo Christian back belief. This is what we, how we roll. We roll in this land as a Judeo-Christian. We're not Sharia law. We're not Islamic law. We're not Hindi law. We're Judeo-Christian. We can go take you down, eye for eye. Or we could turn the other cheek. How we wish to roll. Well, I'm glad we don't live in a Christian land. Who says a lot of clowns? I want to see fired up and burn for what they've done. I don't want to turn the other cheek and let these clowns run loose amongst us and think that oh please forgive me, uh, just kill the kid. Maybe I might kill some more, but you got to forgive me. Jesus is thy savior. Yeah, right. No, I think I'm going to go Judeo on you. I think I'm going to take you down. Thank God we got the balance in this land. <laughs> I heard I. Carl, uh -huh. can you cover the word wish? <laughs> yeah, I can do the word wish for you real quick. Real quick. Yeah, I just so, yeah, because you use a I lot of people I, might not understand what you're saying. Equal justice. If a man slaps you, you can't shoot him in the face with a gun. <laughs> it's equal justice, equal return, an eye for an eye. Okay, what's very simple God, I'm is, um, you know, I'm going to show them it's on my dashboard. I'll be right back. <laughs>